thanks for coming back to the channel. It's been really awesome in the last couple of weeks. All the comments, discussion has been fantastic. It's been great getting to know more of you that have gotten involved with the channel. And right now we're five subscribers away from 500, which is awesome. So I'm hoping that everybody watching right now will go ahead and hit that subscribe button and help us get up above 500 today. Today we're talking about equalization, particularly channel EQ. Now we've covered uh, some other steps along the way, and this is the next step. And that started with the input controls. Uh, we then looked at the high pass filter and now we're at the channel EQ. We're gonna talk about some different types of EQ today other than the channel EQ and if those are confusing or unfamiliar, don't be too worried. I'm gonna cover each thing I talk about in this video in future videos of their own. Like I said, we're working down the channel strip. We're working through the mixing board in this series from input to output, from source to destination. And don't worry if you don't get all the stuff I'm talking about past channel EQ, I will definitely be covering that in a future video. I approach equalization the same as I approach any other tool that we have on a mixing board. Uh, similar to compressors, gates, things like that, I use channel EQ simply to solve problems. I use all EQ just to solve problems. Now, what constitutes a problem can often be a matter of opinion, but when you're behind the mixing board, it's your opinion that counts. During a show, we're constantly listening, we're analyzing, and when something jumps out at us as less than ideal, we investigate, and then hopefully we make a deliberate and informed change. Where you make those changes, though, can be critical and will greatly affect the quality and consistency of your overall mix. By considering each of your inputs and then grouping them in a logical way, we can create a consistent mix much more effectively. Equalizers are filters. They can either cut, boost, or just pass a selected frequency range. So let's look at all the different types of filters you have between your inputs and your outputs, between your source and your destination in a typical sound system. After the input module, which we've covered in this video, we have the high pass filter, which we've covered in this video. Then we get to the channel EQ, which we're covering in this video right now. After that, the next filter in line would be the group EQ. Then we have an option to put EQ on the left right mix bus, the master bus. We also have EQ options at the matrix stage. And then after that, we have EQ on the speaker processor and then going out to the speaker itself. So that's the signal chain from input to output or from source to destination. But when we deploy a sound system, we need to look at that signal chain from the opposite direction. We need to start with the speakers or the destinations and EQ our way back to the inputs. We don't want to start with the channel EQ, and here's why. Starting with the speakers, we use what we typically call system processing. Now this can be DSP uh, built into the speakers themselves, it can be built into the amplifiers, or it can be a standalone box like a DBX drive rack, which you may have seen before. This is where we apply any EQ or presets from the manufacturer to make sure that the boxes are working to their baseline specifications. Now depending on the system, we'll also be able to take measurements at this point and apply equalization and other processing to account for interaction with the room and the physical space that the speakers are in that given day. One step up the chain before the speakers and the system processing are going to be the console's outputs. Whether these outputs are being driven by a matrix or just straight off the left-right output, uh, the output EQ provides a point of processing for the overall system, global changes to the zone or to a feed specifically that's going to affect that entire feed. So if you've got your entire mix is sounding just a little bit too bright, this might be an okay place to go and adjust that uh, on the EQ there. This is really where considering the intent of a change that we're making becomes really important because while we can go to the left, right, or to a matrix output and make an adjustment for something like the mix overall just being a little too bright, if we go to that same EQ and try to solve a feedback problem, we're quickly gonna run into trouble. So imagine you have feedback on a lavalier microphone, you go to your master EQ, you pull out some 4K, and you fix the problem. Awesome, your lav sounds better. Well, now your lav's done and you need to bring up walk-off music for that guest or for that presenter, and you bring up your walk-up music and all of a sudden it sounds like it's underwater because you've just killed that 4K from your entire system. And that's what we're trying to avoid. We wanna create a consistent sound system that we can mix all of our inputs through uh, without any surprises. Only when we go one step further up the chain do we get to group EQ where we can start processing inputs as a group 
and making changes for things like feedback. When mixing a corporate or broadcast style gig, some typical groups we might use would be to group the lectern mics together. Then I might have a group for my host or primary lavalier mics. Then I might have a group for uh, guest or secondary lavalier mics, a group for video playback, uh, a group for sound effects, and so on and so forth down the line. Thinking about the rest of our EQ, at this point we verified that we're running the correct EQ on our speakers and we've dealt with uh, the physical environment of the room at the system processing level. We've used our output EQ to maybe correct for any overall issues with the system. Then we've used our group EQ to create a stable gain stage for our individual sources to operate in. And now we're down finally to the channel EQ. So what's left for us to do with the channel EQ? If you like the videos on this channel, the best way to support the channel is to click on the affiliate links in the description below. You don't even have to buy those products, just following those links helps me greatly. In an ideal world, I'm hoping not to make many or any channel EQ adjustments right off the bat. And here's why. If we think about it, if the source is good, if we've got somebody that's a good, strong presenter, and I've put a quality lavalier mic on them, like a Countryman or a DPA or something along those lines, and I've chosen a good sound system and deployed it and aimed it properly, we've tuned it for the physical space, and then we've used our group EQ to make sure that the mics are stable in the system, we should be pretty close to having a workable product without any channel EQ at all. What I'm hoping for is to keep the channel EQ open to deal with issues as they arise on a local level specific to those individual channels. Now, some examples of that might be uh, somebody's voice sounding different. Uh, some people just have squeaky or dark or high pitched or dull voices. And we want to correct for that a little bit to help it just be more intelligible. Uh, another thing we might want to correct for is an individual environmental issue. So if the presenter on one side of the stage is sitting next to something uh, that's making noise or, or affecting their voice or the pickup pattern in some other way uh, different to the other microphones, we want to be able to handle that locally on the channel EQ. Uh, again, if the microphone that one person is wearing moves or is for some other reason no longer in an ideal placement, we want to be able to correct for EQ individually individually to that microphone. So that's what I want to keep the channel EQ open for. I don't want to use up my channel EQ uh, trying to correct feedback right off the bat because sometimes a presenter or somebody on stage might move or they might adjust a microphone like the lectern microphone and might introduce feedback that you weren't expecting. Uh, or that you hadn't corrected for previously. And you wanna have some filters available right on that input to be able to grab those uh, issues and deal with them as they arise. Now that we know when to use channel EQ, let's take a look at some of the different types and what the benefits are to each and how we go about using them. If we look at, uh Look at our high and low shelf. If we ignore this mid stuff here, uh, you can see right now, if I boost this, that's set to be a shelf. If this was a cheap mixer, I would have a low shelf like this, and I would get a high shelf like this. And that's pretty much all you get. So obviously you can see there's not a whole lot of resolution or granularity in the adjustments you can make with those. You can either pretty much just boost the lows or the highs. On a slightly nicer mixer, we would have a low shelf, a high shelf, and then maybe a center frequency, a mid. And that would typically just be a bell or peaking EQ there in the mid. You may have heard these filters described as either constant Q, where the bandwidth stays a constant as a function of the booster cut amounts, or variable Q, where the Q changes as a function of the booster cut, creating a more narrow filter at the extremes. So as you boost or cut more, the filter gets sharper. As we get nicer again, you might find sweepable uh, lows and mids. Uh, you might find that as an option. And then we get into all sorts of different combinations of parametric and fully parametric and all this other stuff. And basically what we're talking about there is on a parametric EQ, if this is, uh, this is a fully parametric EQ that we're dealing with here, you have the choice of three different parameters on a parametric. You have the frequency that you choose, so where you want to make your cut or boost. You have your gain to apply cut or boost. And then you also have Q, which is the width of that filter. Uh, so we can make a nice uh, narrow cut or a wide boost or cut, uh, vice versa. 
and you can make really, really precise. Now, this is in a in a recording program. On the live consoles, you can get really, really precise uh, with your EQ. So if you need to make a cut that's really, really narrow, we can do that on a live mixing board. This one, not so much. So you can see, depending on the type of EQ you have, it's going to have a drastic effect on how much control you have over your mix at the channel level. Uh, again, another really good reason why we don't want to go hunting for feedback at the channel level, because if you have feedback, say you've got feedback here, uh, 1000 Hertz, and you want to make a cut, you can only get uh, so narrow with some of these filters. If you don't have a console that has really decent EQ in it, you're going to suck out a lot of energy around where you need the voice uh, to be reproduced in an effort to get rid of that feedback. So this is just really not a great place to make uh, feedback cuts unless your console has really high quality EQ uh, that can get nice and narrow. And even then, better to take care of it somewhere else uh, it, to start with. So we can see here a fully parametric EQ is obviously my preference. I like to have the choice over as many parameters as possible on a live event. You never know what you're gonna need to do. Obviously digital consoles are light years better than what we had a few years ago with analog. Uh, but if you're not working on a console that has fully parametric EQ, you certainly wanna save that uh, channel EQ to do more broad strokes. Uh, it's not exactly a surgical tool on a lot of the uh, less expensive mixing consoles on the market. And this is just another quick look at some other EQs that can be used as plugins. These are some Waves plugins here, but just to reinforce the idea that all these different EQs share the same characteristics. Uh, we'll start up here. There's your high pass filter. Uh, low filter, which is a shelf. Then we have a sweepable parametric, a couple of mid bands, a low mid, a high mid. Uh, you can see here we're selecting a narrow to a wide Q. There's your booster cut gain, and then there's your uh, frequency control. Uh, a high shelf here. Going over to the next parametric here, this is a REQ waves uh, gain frequency Q again. Uh, so we select a filter and we can adjust the uh, Q. Uh, sorry, we can adjust the cue accordingly, narrow or wide. Uh, down here is another Waves uh, Vintage VQ3. And this is, again, this is a high pass filter option. You have uh, low filter frequency uh, select here uh, with uh, boost or cut. You select the frequency and then uh, your boost or cut amount. The mid here, again, gives you uh, some options of frequency, booster cut, and these are concentric knobs. Uh, high filter, you just have a couple of frequencies, so that's going to be a shelf EQ there. And then down here, this is just Apple's parametric EQ, which works in the exact same way. You have frequency gain and Q, and if you take a look at the, uh, sorry, the parameters here, you can see you choose the center frequency, uh, the Q of that filter, and then how much gain you want to apply or cut. So that's pretty much how EQ works. So that's it for this video. Again, thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for the comments, for subscribing. It's really exciting to see this community grow. In the past 30 days alone, we've added just about 100 subscribers to the channel, which is just super exciting. It motivates me to put out more stuff and work harder uh, to make more interesting content for you. And it creates more discussion and comments. And I've got a couple of videos coming up in the next few weeks that I think are going to be just fantastic. They're uh, partially shot already, but they're waiting for a specific event to happen and waiting for items to come back in the mail. So stay tuned. It's going to be pretty cool. I'm going to commit right now to upload every single week on Fridays from now on. Uh, I've tried different days of the week. It seems like Friday evenings are popular and then everybody can kind of catch up with the videos as you've done your gigs Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, that seems to be a good time where people want to watch and get involved. So we're going to try that. Let me know what you think. If you like the videos on this channel, click on the affiliate links in the description below. You don't even have to buy those products. Just following those links helps me greatly.